Good evening, friends, fiends, and night owl supremes. Welcome to A Bit Late, where tonight the evening is very pleasant, I must say. I did get to go for a nighttime stroll and the fireflies were out, or lightning bugs, whichever you call them. We called them lightning bugs, but fireflies sound so much more magical and cozy. But it is warm, the fireflies are out, and I hope you're in the mood for a story. Tonight we're reading the fairy tale, The Terrible Head. I know. And if you enjoy myths and mixing mythologies and stories and fairy tales and basically the biggest combination of different fanfics of different stories in one place, I think this you're going to like this story. There's a lot going on. There's never a dull moment. And it is on the longer side. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, go ahead and grab a cup of tea and join me. I actually have some watermelon mint tea. <laughs> It is caffeinated, but I have a long evening ahead of me with work and such. But it's nice and warm and summery and refreshing, so don't do as I do if you are in the mood for something comfy and cozy so you can sleep. You know, probably your herbal teas or your hot chocolates or your decaf coffee beans, whatever you need to get settled and comfy for tonight's story. Of course, summon your animal familiars about you, grab your blankets, pillows, and sconce yourself in a pillow fort of sorts, Light your candles and turn on your fairy lights and join me for tonight's fairy tale, The Terrible Head. Once upon a time, there was a king whose only child was a girl. Now, the king had been very anxious to have a son, or at least a grandson, to come after him, but he was told by a prophet whom he consulted that his own daughter's son should kill him. <laughs> oh, so he's going to be anxious either way, with a grandson or without one. The news terrified him so much that he determined never to let his daughter be married. <laughs> For he thought that it was better to have no grandson at all than to be killed by his grandson. But that seems pretty selfish. Like, if you're the ruler, don't you need... And you're not elected, you're a royalty. Don't you need to have a line of succession or something like that? I don't know. I bet you... I bet you something happens that he was trying to avoid, though. But I'm no prophet. I'm just a storyteller. He therefore called his workmen together and bade them dig a deep round hole in the earth. And then he had a prison of brass built in the hole. Oh no. And then, when it was finished, he locked up his daughter. What? Why even go through all of that? Like, <sighs> come on, king man. No man ever saw her and she never even saw the fields and the sea but only the sky and the sun. Oh, that sounds so harsh. For there was a wide open window in the roof of the house of brass. Oh my, it sounds so uncomfortable. The sun radiating down into the pit of brass. Oh no. So the princess would sit looking up at the sky and watching the clouds float across and wondering whether she should ever get out of her prison. Now, one day it seemed to her that the sky opened above her and a great shower of shining gold fell through the window in the roof and lay glittering in her room. That would hurt if it fell on you. Not very long after, the princess had had a baby. <laughs> Are we mixing mythologies with fairy tales here? Because this sounds like so many myths with labyrinths and princesses buried underground and, uh, is this... Some god, like Jupiter, Zeus, visiting some woman and getting them, um, with child, as happens quite frequently in mythology? Hmm, I think it is. Anyway, so, a shower of gold falls into the deep well. She had a baby, a little boy. But when the king, her father, heard of it, he was very angry and afraid. Well, yeah, because it's sort of a god's baby. What chance does he have now? Half mortal, half god that the child is. For now, the child was born that should be his death. Yet, cowardly as he was, he had not quite the heart to kill the princess and her baby outright. <laughs> no, he'll just bury them in a pit forever. But he had had them put in a large, brass-bound chest and thrust out to sea, that they might either be drowned or starved, or perhaps come to a country where they would be out of his way. Oh yes. Super convenient for you, King, sir. So the princess and the baby floated and drifted in the chest on the sea all day and night. But the baby was not afraid of the waves nor of the wind, 
for he did not know that they could hurt him, and he slept quite soundly. Does the princess know this either, or was she buried underground her whole life too? Anyway, and the princess sang a song over him, and this was her song. Child, my child, how sound you sleep. Though your mother's care is deep, you can lie with a heart at rest. In the narrow brass-bound chest In the starless night and drear You can sleep and never hear Billows breaking and the cry Of the night wind wandering by In soft purple mantle sleeping With your little face on mine Hearing not your mother weeping And the breaking of the brine Well, the daylight came at last And the great chest was driven by the waves against the shore of an island Oh, that's lucky There the brass-bound chest lay With the princess and her baby in it Till a man of that country came past And saw it And dragged it on to the beach And when he had broken it open, behold there was a beautiful lady and little boy. <laughs> I am so disappointed in myself that I keep thinking of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure for this and not every other story with a coffin set afloat on the water. <laughs> and I don't know why, but here we are. Keep seeing Dio. Anyway, I'm not sure how they were breathing in the chest, but this local man saves them. Local man saves mother and child. So he took them home and was very kind to them and brought up the boy till he was a young man. Now when the boy had come to his full strength, the king of that country fell in love with his mother and wanted to marry her. <laughs> oh, how lucky, what chance. But he knew that she would never part from her boy, who was now a grown man. So he thought of a plan to get rid of the boy and this was his plan. Every king wants to get rid of this little boy, or young man now. Not great. Anyway, here's this king's diabolical plan. A great queen of a country not far off was going to be married, and this king said that all his subjects must bring him wedding presents to give her. <laughs> what? That's so backwards. And he made a feast to which he invited them all, and they all brought their presents. Some brought gold cups, and some brought necklaces of gold and amber, and some brought beautiful horses. But the boy had nothing, though he was the son of a princess, for his mother had nothing to give him. She was in a box on the sea. She had nothing, but the purple cloak maybe, which would maybe be a baby blanket size, and he's not that little anymore. Anyway, then the rest of the company began to laugh at him, and the king said, if you have nothing else to give, at least you might go fetch the terrible head. The boy was proud and spoke without thinking. <laughs> Great. Then I swear that I will bring the terrible head, if it may be brought by a living man. But of what head you speak of, I know not. Then they told him that somewhere, a long way off, there dwelt three dreadful sisters. I'm sure they're dreadful. I'm sure they're awesome, and I'm sure I'd like to meet them. Monstrous, ogreish women with golden wings and claws of brass with serpents growing on their heads instead of hair. Yeah, we're picking up on mythology here. Now, these women were so awful to look at that whoever saw them was turned at once into stone. Wow, I've never heard this one before. And two of them could not be put to death, but the youngest, whose face was very beautiful, could be killed and it was her head that the boy had promised to bring. You may imagine it was no easy adventure. <laughs> no, thank you. Maybe I wouldn't be friends with them, but I don't know. They just seem like they're protecting something. Anyway, when he heard all this, he was perhaps sorry that he had sworn to bring the terrible head, but he was determined to keep his oath. So he went out from the feast, where they all sat drinking and making merry, and he walked alone beside the sea in the dusk of the evening, at the place where the great chest, with himself and his mother in it, had been cast ashore. Time is a circle, time is a cycle, this is where it all began for you on this land, young man. Kidding, I don't know where we're going with this. 
There he went and sat down on a rock, looking toward the sea and wondering how he should begin to fulfill his vow. Then he felt someone touch him on the shoulder, and he turned and saw a young man like the king's son, having with him a tall and beautiful lady whose blue eyes shone like stars. They were taller than the mortal men, and the young man had a staff in his hand with golden wings on it. Oh! And two golden serpents twisted around it. And he had wings on his caps and on his shoes. <laughs> oh, I wonder who this is. He spoke to the boy and asked him why he was so unhappy. And the boy told him how he had been sworn to bring the terrible head and knew not how to begin the adventure. Quick fairy tale logic moment though. What if he had brought something? Like he's old enough to have made something of value. Like what if he whittled a really cool goblet or set of cutlery out of something? That could be neat, or made jewelry out of seashells or something interesting. Then this won't even be a story. Which, I guess that's the answer to the question, isn't it? How did the king know he would have nothing, though? Hmm, a little too knowing of the king. Anyway, these two tall beings, who uh, seem a lot like gods to me, appear next to him. Then the beautiful lady also spoke, and said that it was a foolish oath and hasty but it might be kept if a brave man had sworn it. Then the boy answered that he was not afraid if only he knew the way. Then the lady said that to kill the dreadful woman with the golden wings and the brass claws and to cut off her head, he needed three things. First, a cap of darkness, which would make him invisible when he wore it. Next, a sword of sharpness, which would cleave iron at one blow. And... Last, the shoes of swiftness with which he might fly in the air. Now those sound cool. The boy answered that he knew not where such things were to be procured and that, wanting them, he could only try and fail. Then the young man, taking off his own shoes, said, First you shall use these shoes till you have taken the terrible head, and then you must give them back to me. And with these shoes you will fly as fleet as a bird or a thought over the land or over the waves of the sea, wherever the shoes know the way. That's handy, GPS navigation before GPS navigation. But there are ways which they do not know, roads beyond the borders of the world, and these roads you have to travel. Now first you must go to the three gray sisters who live far off in the north and are so very cold that they have only one eye and one tooth among the three. This is like the fairy and fairer than a fairy. Or the fates in Hercules. I'm not sure about their dental situation though, but I do know they shared an eye. You must creep up close to them, and as one of them passes the eye to the other, you must seize it, and refuse to give it up till they have told you the way through the three fairies of the garden. And they will give you the cap of darkness and the sword of sharpness and show you how to win beyond this world to the land of the terrible head. There's a lot of threes going on here. The three gray sisters, the three fairies of the garden, the cap of darkness, the winged shoes, the sharp sword. Three, three, three. Some tales in fairy tales, it's sevens. Sometimes it's three. Usually it's three. And this is one of those. Then the beautiful lady said, Go forth at once and do not return to say goodbye to your mother, for these things must be done quickly, and the shoes of swiftness themselves will carry you to the land of the three gray sisters, for they know the measure of that way. So the boy thanked her and fastened on the shoes of swiftness, and that's really tough to say a lot and quickly, and turned to say goodbye to the young man and the lady, but behold, they had vanished, and he knew not how or where. But we probably do, friends and fiends. Such is the way of immortals. The story did not outright say that, that's my hunch though. Then he leaped in the air to try the shoes of swiftness, and they carried him more swiftly than the wind, over the warm blue sea, over the happy lands of the south, over the northern peoples who drank mare's milk and lived in great wagons, wandering after their flocks, across the wide rivers where the wild fowl rose and fled before him, and over the plains and the cold north sea he went, over the fields of snow and the hills of ice to a place where the world ends and all water is frozen, and there are no men, nor beasts, nor any green grass. 
There in a blue cave of ice he found the three gray sisters, the oldest of living things. And he's about to steal from them, really now, come on. They are Thra, you can't do this. Their hair was as white as the snow and their flesh of an icy blue. And they mumbled and nodded in a kind of dream. And their frozen breath hung round them like a cloud. Now the opening of the cave in the ice was narrow and it was not easy to pass in without touching one of the Grey Sisters. But floating on the shoes of swiftness, the boy just managed to steal in and waited till one of the sisters said to another, who had their one eye, Sister, what do you see? Do you see old times coming back? No, sister. Then give me the eye for perchance. So I can see farther than you. Then the first sister passed the eye to the second, but as the second groped for it, the boy caught it cleverly out of her hand. Where's the eye, sister? said the second gray woman. You have taken it yourself, sister, said the first gray woman. Have you lost the eye, sister? Have you lost the eye? said the third gray woman. Shall we never find it again and see old times coming back? I want to know what these old times are. Really bad. Or maybe I don't. I don't know. Are titans ruling the earth? But that would really stink if you drop the eye and no one can see where it went. But I suppose that's why they're in a small cave, so they can easily feel it for it with their fingers. Alas, not this time though, because sneaky boy has it. Then the boy slipped from behind them and out of the cold cave into the air, and he laughed aloud. <laughs> Jerk. When the gray women heard that laugh, they began to weep, for now they knew that a stranger had robbed them, and they could not help themselves, and their tears froze as they fell from the hollows where no eyes were. Oh gosh. And rattled on the icy ground of the cave. Then they began to implore the boy to give them back their eye again and he could not help being sorry for them. Well, good. They were so pitiful, but he said he would never give them the eye till they told him the way to the fairies of the garden. Then they wrung their hands miserably, for they guessed why he had come, and how he was going to try to win the terrible head. Oh, do they want to protect those other three with the snake hairs? Now the dreadful women were akin to the three gray sisters and it was hard for them to tell the boy the way. Well, yeah, they want to stick together. But at last they told him to keep always south, and with the land on his left and the sea on his right, till he reached the island of the fairies of the garden. Then he gave them back their eye, well, good, and they began to look out more for the old times coming back again. But the boy flew south between land and sea, keeping the land always on his left-hand side, till he saw a beautiful island crowned with flowering trees. There he alighted and there he found the three fairies of the garden. They were very like three beautiful young women, one dressed in green, one in white, and one in red. And they were dancing and singing round an apple tree with apples of gold, and this was their song. Round and round the apples of gold, round and round dance we. Thus do we dance from the days of old about the enchanted tree. Round and round and round we go, while the spring is green or the stream shall flow, or the wind shall stir the sea. There is none may taste of the golden fruit till the golden new time come. Many a tree shall spring from shoot, many a blossom be withered at root, many a song be dumb. Broken and still shall be many a loot, or ever the new times come. Round and round the tree of gold, round and round dance we. So doth the great world spin from of old, summer and winter, fire and cold. Song that is sung and tale that is told, even as we dance. That fold and unfold round the stem of the fairy tree. These grave dancing fairies were very unlike the gray women, and they were glad to see this boy and treated him kindly. Probably because he didn't just steal their eye. I don't know. Just a thought. 
Then they asked him why he had come, and he told them how he was sent to find the sword of sharpness and the cap of darkness. And the fairies gave him these, and a wallet, and a shield, and belted the sword, which had a diamond blade round his waist, and the cap they set on his head. <laughs> I picture Link getting equipped with stuff. And told him that now even they could not see him, though they were fairies. Then he took it off, and they each kissed him and wished him good fortune. And then they began their eternal dance around the golden tree, for it is their business to guard it until the new times come, or till the world's ending. It's a pretty serious job, even though it's all fun and dance. But that's probably why they want him to usher in the new era, so they can stop dancing, and people can finally eat the golden fruit. Maybe? So the boy put the cap on his head, and hung the wallet round his waist and the shining shield on his shoulders, and flew beyond the great river that lies coiled like a serpent round the whole world. Cool. And by the banks of that river, there he found the three terrible women, all asleep beneath a poplar tree, and the dead poplar leaves lay all about them. Their golden wings were folded and their brass claws were crossed, and two of them slept with their hideous heads beneath their wings like birds. Oh, they're so peaceful. And the serpents in their hair writhed out from under the feathers of gold. But the youngest slept between her two sisters, and she lay on her back, with her beautiful, sad face turned to the sky. And though she slept, her eyes were wide open. Cool. If the boy had seen her, he would have changed into stone by the terror and pity of it. She was so awful. What? But he had thought of the plan for killing her without looking on her face. Hmm, I wonder what his plan is and if we've heard it before. As soon as he caught sight of the three from afar, he took his shining shield from his shoulders and held it up like a mirror so that he saw the dreadful woman reflected in it and he did not see the terrible head itself. Then he came nearer and nearer till he reckoned that he was within a sword strike of the youngest. Objects and mirror are not closer than they appear, I hope. And he guessed where he should strike a back blow behind him. Then he drew the sword of sharpness and struck once, and the terrible head was cut from the shoulders of the creature. Aww. And the blood leapt out and struck him like a blow. Oh, that's powerful. But he thrust the terrible head into his wallet and flew away without looking back. Then the two dreadful sisters who were left wakened rose in the air like great birds, and though they could not see him because of his cap of darkness, they flew after him up the wind, following by the scent through the clouds, like hounds hunting in a wood. They came so close that he could hear the clatter of their golden wings and their shrieks to each other. Here, here, no, there, there, he's this way. This is the way he went, as they chased him. But the shoes of swiftness flew too fast for them, and at last their cries and the rattle of their wings died away as he crossed the great river that runs around the world. Now when the horrible creatures were far in the distance and the boy found himself on the right side of the river, he flew straight eastward trying to seek his own country. But as he looked down from the air, he saw a very strange sight. A beautiful girl chained to a stake in the high water mark of the sea. <sighs> wow, this tale just combines a lot of myths together, doesn't it? Nope, nope. Hmm, there's like no focus. That's okay, it's all fun. The girl was so frightened or so tired that she was only prevented from falling by the iron chain around her waist. And there she hung as if she were dead. The boy was very sorry for her and flew down and stood beside her. When he spoke, she raised her head and looked round, but his voice only seemed to frighten her. Then he remembered that he was wearing the cap of darkness and that she could only hear him, not see him. So he took it off and there he stood before her, the handsomest young man she had ever seen in all her life, with short curly yellow hair, blue eyes, and a laughing face and he thought her the most beautiful girl in the world. Wow. <laughs> nice, I guess. Finding true love in the scariest of places, or true attraction, anyway? I don't know. You know how this is probably gonna go, though. 
So first, with one blow of the Sword of Sharpness, he cut the iron chain that bound her, and then asked her what she did there. <laughs> By the way, madam, what are you doing on this here rock? And why the men treated her so cruelly? And she told him that she was the daughter of the king of that country, and that she was tied here to be eaten by a monstrous beast out of the sea. Oh, I went, hmm. Why would her father kill her now if it's his mother? Do you know what I mean? Because he's already born. Just spiteful at that point. Anyway, she was the daughter of the king of that country, and that she was tied there to be eaten by a monstrous beast out of the sea. For the beast came and devoured a girl every day. Now the lot had fallen on her. And as she was saying this, a long, fierce head of a cruel sea monster rose out of the waves and snapped at the girl. But the beast had been too greedy and too hurried. He was used to easy meals. So he missed his aim the first time. Before he could rise and bite again, the boy had whipped the terrible head out of his wallet and held it up. And when the sea beast leapt out one more time, its eyes fell on the head and instantly it was turned into stone. And the stone beast is there on the sea coast to this day. Oh, plan a trip to go visit that. Sounds awesome. Then the boy and the girl went to the palace of the king, her father, where everyone was weeping for her death, and they could hardly believe their eyes when they saw her come back well. I mean, I'm glad they're happy and they're not upset. Oh, you didn't get eaten by the monster. How dare you? Everybody else did. You should too. No, they're happy. This is good, <laughs> right? And the king and queen made much of the boy and could not contain themselves for delight when they found out he wanted to marry their daughter. <laughs> oh, wow. So the two were married with the most splendid rejoicings. And when they had passed some time at the court, they went home in a ship to the boy's own country. I wonder that he didn't fly there with his shoe wings. He never did give them back to the god, did he? I mean, the tall person. We don't know that they're gods, by the way. That's just me conjecturing. Ah, this is... And if I would have read ahead, I would have seen. For he could not carry his bride through the air. So he took the shoes of swiftness and the cap of darkness and the sword of sharpness up to a lonely place in the hills. There he left them, and there they were found by the man and woman who had met him at home beside the sea, and it helped him to start on his journey. Well good, they got their things back, but I don't like the idea of this king who wanted to marry the boy's mother. Having this terrible, powerful weapon that still works is also the head of a lady. Ugh. When this had been done, the boy and his bride set forth home and landed in the harbor of his native land. But whom should he meet in the very street of the town but his own mother, flying for her life from the wicked king, who now wished to kill her because he found that she would never marry him? <laughs> well, he probably should have asked her first before doing this whole scheme. Whatever, though. Fairy tales and myths, my friends. For if she had liked the king ill before, she liked him far worse now that he had caused her son to disappear so suddenly. Well, yeah. She did not know, of course, where the boy had gone, but thought the king had slain him secretly. Yeah, that's, well, that is logical. So now she was running for her very life, and the wicked king was following her with a sword in his hand, and no one in the city is going to stop him? <laughs> He's just chasing this lady through the street with a sword? Please. Then behold, she ran into her son's very arms but he had only time to kiss her and step in front of her when the king struck at him with his sword. The boy caught the blow on his shield and cried to the king, I swore to bring you the terrible head and see how I keep my oath. The timing in this fairy tale slash myth is amazing. Then he drew forth the head from his wallet, and when the king's eyes fell on it instantly, he was turned into stone, just as he stood with his sword lifted. Nice. Now all the people rejoiced because the wicked king should rule them no longer. And they asked the boy to be their king, but he said no, he must take his mother home to her father's house. Why? She doesn't want to go, I'm sure. He wanted her dead. He buried her underground. He wants her son gone too. <laughs> like, this is not a good idea. 
So the people chose for king the man who had been kind to his mother when she was first cast on the island in the great chest. That's a good king, I'm sure. He seems like a kind man at least. Presently, the boy and his mother and his wife set sail for his mother's own country, from which she had been driven so unkindly. I'm not sure why they're going back. But on the way, they stayed at the court of the king, and it happened that he was holding games and giving prizes to the best runners, boxers, and quoit throwers. Then the boy would try his strength with the rest, but he threw the quoit so far that it went beyond what had ever been thrown before and fell in the crowd, striking a man so that he died. <laughs> oh, well, you know, prophecies. We know who this was. Now this man was no other than the father of the boy's mother, who had fled away from his own kingdom for fear his grandson should find him and kill him after all. <laughs> thus he was destroyed by his own cowardice and by chance. And thus the prophecy was fulfilled. But the boy and his wife and his mother went back to the kingdom that was theirs and lived long and happily after all their troubles. The end. Dear friends and fiends of this epic, mythologic fairy tale, <laughs> my goodness, chance, timing, mixing things, all in one place. It was pretty awesome. Very entertaining, I will say. There was never a boring moment in this fairy tale. Not that a lot of fairy tales have boring moments, they tend to just like cut those out, but there was always something to do and always something to see and always somewhere to go in this tale. It's like keeping up with this kid was, was pretty tough <laughs> because he had, you know, swift shoes or whatever, so he had a pretty good advantage. But that was the story of the terrible head, and it maybe it should be called the stories of the terrible kings, I don't know, but regardless, I hope you enjoyed the telling of it. And that your mind is at ease and at peace because none of those things that this character did we have to do today, which is, thank goodness. But do let me know what you think of the story in the comments below what your favorite part was. And if you're still up and awake and doing something, stick around for more tales. But now, off to sleep and dream what you will or stay a while and enjoy another tale. Whichever you choose, I'll speak to you again. And until then, stay swift and sharp, my friends. Good night.